started using stenciling because very early in the formation, when I was first trying to figure things out, I had found these kind of appliques that I wanted to use. And I went back to buy more of them and there were no more. And so I had to figure out my own way to be able to apply these patterns to the fabric. Stenciling is unique to the school of making in Alabama Jan and it's become an integral part of all of the products that we make. You have this, you know, fabric color. All you do is throw a stencil over it and apply the paint. And when you pull the stencil away, you suddenly have a pattern. And so it's, it's quite immediate and very gratifying, that moment of the reveal when the stencil peels back. The stenciling becomes part of the finished piece because you sew right on the stenciled line, but then you trim away everything about an eighth of an inch inside your stitched line. And so you're left with a small sliver of this color of paint, which adds like another graphic element to the embroideries, which I think is very beautiful. Stenciling can be an intimidating part of the process for some people, but like anything, it just takes a little practice. First, we'll cut out our stencil and then apply the design to our fabric using a few different methods. So stenciling has been really the cornerstone of our lean method manufacturing system at Alabama Channon, and it's really the basis for everything that we do at the School of Making. And there's a lot of different ways to think about stencil design. So, you know, do you want to work with a floral? Do you like something more geometric? Scale plays a really important part. So for this class, we're working with our Magdalena stencil, which you can download from your class materials and again that can be printed out using a local printer that's used to working with architectural renderings or drawings. We've printed out the Magdalena in three different scales here. The first one here was the original size which was really quite small so you can see when you get down into this area here the pieces were very very small. This is sort of a medium scale blown up from that and then a very large scale. So when we were working on the design we found that this scale was the most appealing to us and so I'll show you what that looks like when it's at the full scale. You can see that this particular pattern as well has a scale change within the design of the pattern. So, you know, the elements at this end are much larger and start to get smaller as they come down to the tip of the stencil. So you can work with a stencil that's this large. This is the size that we work with when we're creating our garments, but you can take elements of the stencil and work with it on a smaller scale. For example, you can just take a section of the stencil like what you have right here and use that for your home stencil. Some people find this a little easier to manage in this scale. And you don't even have to worry about these pieces that have been cut off. You can just leave those off of your stencil and you'll wind up having a very beautiful design that you can then repeat on your garment. Also, there's a couple of different ways to think about how you use the stencil on your garment. So sometimes we choose to place a stencil just around the hem of a skirt, for example, or over the shoulder of a garment. Other times you may want the stencil to cover the, you know, all of the design. So we call that stencil just at the bottom a placement stencil. So placing it in some specific area of the project or an all-over stencil which covers the entire project. So our first stencils that we make, we use a material called pennant felt. This is like, you know, collegiate flags, pennants. It really is what they use to make those, but it's a pretty sturdy material and will stand up to the paint and is very easy to cut. We have this from the School of Making, but, you know, the very first stencils that I made when I was beginning this work, we really, we use poster board. You can find mylar at hobby stores. Um, we also have mylar stencils that we sell, which we're going to be using a little bit later in this class, showing you in the full scale how we airbrush through those large stencils. So to get started making your own stencil, really all you need is your design printed out on a piece of paper. And um, we're just going to turn this over on the back and use some um, spray adhesive because we want that um, paper really to adhere closely to the pennant felt so that it doesn't shift as we're cutting. So I'm just going to put a very light coat of this on the back, making sure I get the edges. Then I'm just going to turn it over and center it on this piece of pennant felt that's been cut about to that size. And then I'm just going to make sure that it's adhered down. So you want to leave about a two inch, one and a half to two inch frame around your stencil. If you cut too close to the edge, sometimes your, your stencil can become a bit flimsy. And as I mentioned before, if this is a good size for you to work with and you don't want to do the full stencil, what you might want to do is take a pencil or something like this and just finish up these designs so it doesn't feel cut off there. You can even choose not to cut these out, just eliminate those from designs. You can just put a mark on them so you know where 
where you're cutting, and um, you'll wind up with a stencil that you can use fluidly over any project. So this can really be done with any stencil pattern that you can find. You know, there are a lot of stencil patterns and books available on the market. We have other stencils that you can download from the School of Making. There are pre-cut stencils available at hobby stores, so any of those things are great for doing this work that we do. I'm going to start with this shape over here. You know, you hold a exacto knife. Be very careful. These are very sharp, and there are stories of people who've really hurt themselves using this, so just take great care when you're using a knife like this. You hold it just exactly like you would a pencil. The grip is made so that there's a place for your finger that you can keep it really steady. I always lift up my pennant felt just a little bit, so keep your fingers out of the way, and then you, you really just want to trace with the knife exactly along the stenciling as much as you can. You see I missed a little part right there, but those little deviations are what make the stencil really yours. And you just go very slowly. Make sure that you have a sharp knife when you're doing this. It does uh, seem counterintuitive, but it's safer to cut with a sharp knife because you don't have to press as hard. So I think I have the top paper layer done. So I'm just going to lift this up a little bit and see where I am with my stencil. Oops, it's coming right out. I've got a little bit hung up right there. I'm just going to kind of saw through that bit. And you can kind of stab that piece, usually, and it'll pull right out. A lot of people like to save these little tiny pieces to use for painting over or tracing around and whatnot. And you just continue this process all the way along. Just turn the stencil as you go. Again, you can lift it up ever so slightly, a kind of saw through the piece. See how easy that goes? It's just like cutting butter. This comes over here. Put this down a little bit. I'm getting too far off the stencil. There we go. You'll find, uh, once you do this, you'll find that everybody has their own little method for the best way to get their stencil cut, but I think you'll find that you really enjoy this once you get started. It's very satisfying to get that bit finished and work through, and it does go a lot faster than you than you think it does. And you can just do that all the way around and finish cutting. Next, we're going to go over how then to transfer this stencil to your fabric. We've shown you how to make stencils using a variety of different materials that we work with. I have here one of our full-scale Magdalena Mylar stencils from the School of Making, and we're going to test out some different ways to transfer the stencil to the cotton jersey fabric. So to get started, I'm going to turn this stencil over to the back side, and I'm going to use a tiny bit of spray adhesive on the back, and this just makes a nice bond between the fabric and the stencil itself. So I'm just going to cover this area where I'm going to be working. And I'm going to flip this back over. You can see it already starts to adhere slightly to the table. I've got one of our pre-cut swatches here that I'm just going to put up under. Make sure that it's laying flat against the surface. And I'm going to pull my stencil up and place it down right over that area. And you can see you can just kind of pat the stencil down and that adhesive on the back will help it adhere so that it makes that nice bond and keeps the paint from going under the stencil. So it's adhered nicely now to the fabric behind it. There's many, many different kinds of um, fabric pens now available that really make a permanent mark on the fabric. This happens to be a really nice one because it has two sizes of uh, tips on it. You know, this is really just about as simple as it gets. So all you do is take your uh, marker and just put it on the inside of the stencil and begin to trace around. You can go back over it and make some areas thicker and some more thin. Or you can choose the thicker side. And you know, obviously it makes a thicker line as you go around. And it can even be beautiful to use both sides. You know, the entire stencil doesn't need to be exactly the same. And remember, for our regular reverse applique, you're going to be stitching right on this line, so you'll have that line of thread going right over the top of it. The next method that we are going to use is these uh, makeup sponges, little tiny wedges. Makeup wedges are available at any drugstore or place where they sell makeup, and these are great tools for sponging paint onto the fabric. So we have this paint that we have from the School of Making. We have chose our color fog, but this is a great step in the process to try out different colors, you know, figure out how you want to transfer your stencil on. So I'm just going to pour a little bit of this into the paper plate. We'll just work some of the stencils there. So we keep just an extra little scrap of fabric here. Sometimes the paint can get a little too thick on the sponge from the beginning, so it's nice to kind of dip the paint in, clean it up just a little bit here so that the paint doesn't go on too thickly. And then we're just going to take it and dab it right over the top of that stencil of the fabric there. And obviously you'll be going around the entire stencil shape. 
I like this transfer method because it, it gives a kind of ombre effect across the base of the stencil. If one area is a little more heavy and one area is a little more light, I think that's a really beautiful effect. So just dab that in. And um, you can, if you're very careful, you can lift up your stencil just to see, you know, how it's going. If you've got your, you can see it's starting to fill in there and see what that looks like. i put this back down now. Give it another little pat. Then we have several methods. There are several methods available on the market these days that you can try. There's this sprayer, which has a can that attaches to a, to a bottle of paint at the bottom. Our experience with this has been that a lot of paint goes through really quickly, so you want to be kind of careful. And you also, anytime you're spraying things down, you're going to want to wear a mask to keep from inhaling those particles. So I have just a little paper mask. I'm going to put this on here and um, show you how this one works. So you can see it painting with something that sprays through gives a flatter, more flush coverage of the stencil shapes. So those are just a couple of methods, easy methods, that you can use to transfer your stencil to the project that you're working on. At Alabama Channon, we use an airbrush gun, a simple, uh, very simple unit that just is connected to a regular compressor, like you can get at any homeware store, or you might have at your home right now. Uh, we do have our table set at a 45 degree angle, so that it makes it easier for the paint to go down. I mean, we've just set the table up on blocks. You can use canned goods at your house or anything just to lift it up ever so slightly. So to get ready for this larger piece, I'm going to add a little bit more spray adhesive to my product, because it's pretty big here. So I'm just going to go back over this. I'm going to set this to the side a little bit. There we go. While that dries, I'm going to take my skirt panel, one, one piece of my cut skirt. I want to make sure that the face of the fabric is facing up. And then I want to just kind of pat this into place like we did with the fabric when we were cutting. You can see that there's a little spray adhesive on the table and that helps keep this flat here. So make sure my edges are all down. Now, this is a time when you can decide, you know, do you want the larger part of the, of the stencil at the top or at the bottom of the skirt? So for my purposes, I'm going to put the bottom, the larger part at the bottom here. Place it like this. And then we take uh, some t-shirts, old t-shirts um, that we use around the office or in the studio. We'll just lay these on top of the stencil and kind of um, rub it down so that it has made a good contact with the fabric below. Just move that around. Uh, you can see we also use these as masks, so you can even use one to mask off your area here when you're painting in this area so that you don't get it on your table. So um, otherwise you will get the paint there. And we do use this um, chopstick sometimes just to kind of make sure that these areas are adhered uh, while we're spraying there. So here's our uh, little small airbrush gun. We've put our fog uh, paint into it already. And so the airbrush gun is a pretty simple apparatus. It just attaches to this air hose here and uh, brings the air up through this nozzle and sprays it out onto the fabric. So I'm ready now to do just a little test spray of my airbrush gun. First I'm going to take a mask to protect from the airborne particles. So the best method for this is to use kind of a sweeping action across the surface of the stencil. So you, uh, we work kind of stencil shape by stencil shape in a sweeping method so that the paint falls in a rather even coverage across it. So I'm going to put my mask on and do this now. Okay, I'm just going to move my shirt over here to kind of protect the table underneath. Okay, so it looks like we've gotten all of our stencil covered. I'm going to move this back and we'll just check it out. So just go very carefully. This is still wet, so you don't want to smear your paint in any way. Oh yes, it looks like we got a great coverage. Just go slowly. At this point, you can still, if you need to, you can still get the stencil back down and go over it again if you're feeling like it's not gotten good coverage. But it looks like, for our purposes here, that we've gotten all of our shapes and it's looking really beautiful. Now the stencil is going to be wet, so you want to be careful not to, uh, you know, not to smear it on any of your other panels. So you're going to want to either hang this up and let it dry or let it dry on the table until you're ready for your next piece. So we have a little clothesline set up and we take our um, pieces once they're sprayed and just hang them over the clothesline just so the paint doesn't 
touch on itself or touch one of the other pieces. And that's a great way to let things dry. So let's talk about some of the tips that we've learned over the years just working with the airbrush. So the apparatus itself has a little tiny hole right here. It's really important that that stays clear of paint. So you might sometimes just take a, a straight pen and just poke it down in there just to make sure that that's staying clear. One of the other things if you're having trouble getting paint out of your gun is to turn this nozzle ever so slightly. Do it in very small movements. It has to be at right exactly the right level for the air to pull the paint out of this little nozzle right here. So um, small adjustments with this can help more paint go out or less paint if you're having to fiddle with that. Another thing that's really important is to keep the entire brush clean. The paint dries pretty quickly, so even your bottles of paint, you want to keep your lids on them. If they get solids in them, it makes it harder for the paint to come through this tiny little nozzle right here. So those are a few things. You know, keep those t-shirts around that you can dry your, your stencil off, that you can cover up your table, take your jewelry off, wear an apron. It is um, kind of messy. You're going to get it. You may get it on your hands or on your table. So, you know, just a few small things. Take some precautions to protect your, your working space. You know, it is uh, much easier than it seems, and it only takes a little bit of practice to really master this technique. And so don't be afraid of the airbrush. You know, play with it, use it. You know, if the stencil doesn't make us a, a very strong bond to the fabric, the paint can slip up under it and make something called, oh, we call overspray where the the paint kind of flares out from the stencil shape or on the other side you could have too little paint on it where a whole shape isn't completely covered you know you can always go back in and trace this out or you know sponge more paint on so this is really it's not rocket science and you know with a little bit of fun and play you definitely will master this technique so um, have just have fun with it <music> Once your panels are dry to the touch, we're ready to put our outer and our inner layer together. So we're going to start with our inner layer, laying it flat out on the table. Again, we want the base of the fabric up and the back of the fabric on the table. Then our dried stencil piece is going to go over the top of that, the stenciling out. And the best way to do this is kind of to pat the fabric in on the face. Then we're going to turn it over to the back, and you can see there's still these ripples in the back. So we're going to go to the back and realign some of this just to make sure that everything is lining up. Put it back over. And you may have to do this several times. Our method at Alabama Channon is that the larger the piece is, the more often you have to flip front to back to get this very perfect bond. And when you're doing this, just take your time. Try not to, you know, start putting something together when you're trying to rush out the door to catch a train or, you know, in a hurry. The more uh, closely you get these together at this point, the more beautiful your project will be in the end. Um, we don't normally iron anything. Um, these folds that you see in here will come out during the sewing process, and it's not going to affect how your piece comes together. But... It looks really um, beautiful. The two pieces seem to be married, <laughs> married together. So folks always ask about what do I do about this little edge here that's you know a little too large, and I would say just cut this off. As long as you're not cutting off more than a sixteenth of an inch, it's it's really not going to hurt the overall fit of your skirt. So, you know. Um, this is a really beautiful part of the process of making. I know that stenciling can be a little bit intimidating, but just settle in and try it. Know, know that it doesn't have to be perfect and, you know, just really enjoy it. So in the next lesson, we'll work on our reverse applique technique, look at a few different ways to use it, and do some test swatches. When I was growing up, the Shoals community was well on its way to becoming the t-shirt capital of the world, and that was a deep part of our economic development and funded the livelihood of many, many families. And so I think when that started to collapse, we all began to really understand the value of that. And I'm not saying that people didn't understand the value of it at the time, but I think it became really apparent what a deep part of our community that was. At the School of Making and at Alabama Chan, and this idea of not only economic stability and economic economic sustainability, but also this kind of cultural sustainability, which for us has to do with local jobs, with people being able to craft beautiful products and craft their own income through those beautiful products. But also just when I first came back, it wasn't so easy to find people who were still passing on these embroidery skills and quilting skills and sustaining these techniques that have been passed down from generation to generation has really become a vital part of our mission as a company. When I was graduating high school, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to hit 
I hit the ground running, like never looked back. But it's so funny that sometimes when you turn home and face home and come home and embrace that, that you really first find your place in the world. And so I think it took me going away to come back and really truly know what the value of my community is and was. This is the core of what we do at the School of Making in Alabama Shannon. And for me, this is the most enjoyable part of the process. I love that saying, the journey is the destination. And this is really a great part of the journey for me. We're going to bring the two layers together here and then show you how the reverse applique technique as well as negative reverse applique technique work together. There are a lot of different options within this one basic process. So you can use this time to discover what you like best. I have some swatches here, pre-made. This is what we would call quilting. And it just shows the finished swatch with the stitching around each of the stencil shape with the running stitch or the straight stitch as we call it. Once we've sewn around all the shapes we will remove or cut the area out on the top layer to reveal the color underneath. We have two different ways of sewing at Alabama Channon either with putting our knots with their tails on the outside of the fabric or putting those tails on the back of the fabric. You can see that it has just a slightly different appearance. You know, one has more texture, the other is a little more flat, and it's really just what you like best or what you think fits your project best. One is not more, you know, durable than the other. One is not better than the other. It's really a question of personal taste. And so it's good to decide ahead of time because the way you sew, whether you enter from the top or come up from the bottom, you need to know what side you want to have your knots on. And you can also put some knots on the front and some on the back, so it's completely up to what you'd like to do for your individual things. I've got my two swatches here ready to go. I'm going to put these on the side. I've got my outer layer stenciled and my backing layer in Dove. So, you know, we've talked about grain lines several times and the face and the back of the fabric. So our rule at Alabama Channon and the School of Making is for the face of the fabric to face up or away from the body so that when you trim the reverse applique away, you'll be looking through the cut outer layer to see the face of the backing layer. So I've laid this my backing layer out on the table and I'm going to take my stenciled outer layer and I'm just going to place it over it and just like I did with the fabric before I'm just going to kind of pat it into place. So it's really important when you start to work with these larger pieces and even the larger the piece the more important this becomes. You don't want to stretch the fabric too much because the knit of the cotton jersey can actually warp if you really pull on it in any way. So you just want to kind of pat this in and as I mentioned before cotton jersey fabric is very forgiving because the two layers kind of cling to one another but you do want to go ahead and pin here and we'll use a technique that we call scattering the pins so a lot of people who have history with machine sewing will have want to kind of pin around the edges but when you do this it doesn't hold the center of the pieces together so as you're sewing those two layers could possibly slip so what you do is you just scatter a few pins around and generally you want to use fewer pins and more because as you're doing the hand sewing and have that excess thread it can very easily get caught up on these pins so it's better to have, you know, a few less than really lots and lots of pins. So I've got my pieces pinned together. I have some needles here, some regular sewing needles from the School of Making. You can see there's a lot of different sizes. I personally like a little bit of a larger needle when I'm working, so I'm going to take this one right here. I've got my slate thread. Remember, we looked at what the design looked like with several different thread colors, and we decided on slate. So I'm going to get my thread to the right length here. Tangling up just a little bit. I always like to cut slightly at an angle. My thread is just a little bit longer than my elbow, but that's going to be okay. I'm going to find my nap, which is here, and thread my needle. There we go. I like to even my threads up just a little bit, and then of course I'm going to love my threads. There are lots of different ways that you can sew these two layers together. And again, like the swatch that we looked at very first, you can leave just the stitching and not cut out the inner layer. We call that technique just simple quilting, and we've made beautiful garments using that technique. So I've also seen during the course of all the workshops that we teach, you know, it can be very beautiful as well to only cut part of the area away and leave some of the other uncut so quilted. Um, this is a, a great time to experiment with all these different ways of working with embroidery and embellishment to really get a piece that feels like yours. I'm going to tie my double knot. Remember that I've done this a lot of times so I can almost always make the two knots land on top of one another. So I'm going to turn my swatch this way and start with this one shape right here. I am going to put my knots on the outside. I really like that way a lot where 
all the work shows on the outside. So as I mentioned before, anytime you're sewing on a cut edge right here, you want to come in about an eighth of an inch. If you leave your knot too close to the edge, it could kind of fall off that edge. Usually the seams are either you know in the construction or rolled up at the hem so it, it really doesn't matter that much but the best practice is to go ahead and come on in about an eighth of an inch i'm going to go down and just come up to get my project started you can see my thread is not quite even there so i'm going to pull my thread through here get it nice and tight i'll sometimes take my finger and run it back down towards the eye of the needle just to make sure that the two strands are the same length now if i wanted my knots on the back of the project instead of coming down from the top I would have brought my needle underneath the project and come up from the bottom and then my knots would be tucked away on the back side so I'm just going to sew here start my process of working around this one stencil shape remember that if you'll pull in the same direction that you're sewing it will help with that knotting again we want to keep our stitches about between an eighth and a quarter of an inch and always check the back to make sure that your stitches are not getting too small and that you don't have any excess looping on the back that might cause the two layers of fabric to separate. Check your tension as you go to make sure that your, you know, your two layers are neither puckering or buckling in together. And I normally just you know, make sure that my stitches both front and back are smooth and tight. When you come to the edge, like what I'm doing here, you know, a lot of folks will always ask, what if I overshoot my stencil shape? Well, it doesn't really matter. You just carry on. You see I kind of overshot my stencil shape there ever so slightly. And I'm just going to come back and go back down. And once the entire piece is finished, you won't notice that, that tiny little piece right there. So I'm going to keep going here. Turning that curve, I can get a little bit of a loop. But I've just straightened that out. Come on back around. Just going to finish sewing this up. You can see I take several stitches at a time. I'm going to align my thread. You can actually use the eye of your needle to go back in if you have any stitches that you're not really happy with. You can go ahead and use this to kind of pull things through and realign things. So I'm going to pull all this, use my individual threads to pull them through and make sure everything's nice and smooth. Looks good. I always want to make sure I fix my tension before I tie the knot off because afterwards it's very hard to smooth everything out. So for my knot, I'm just going to make a loop and sew through this loop. Again, I like to use my finger to hold that down, keep it right down next to the surface of the fabric. And then that second loop, if you can get the loop up and up under that first knot, it normally will just pull right in. Then I'll use my finger to just give it a little tug. Now I'm going to go ahead and clip this longer tail here. Now, there's several things that folks always ask at workshops. Um, one of them is, you know, how should I sew? Should I start in the center? We have a couple rules of thumb. You should either start on one side and work towards the other side, or start in the middle and radiate out. We don't recommend starting from one side, switching to the other side, and then working towards the middle. Because you could, I've never seen it happen, but you could, in theory, wind up with a little buckle in the middle of your project, which you definitely don't want. One of the other questions that comes up often is, should I sew? everything first and then cut or should I cut as I sew and it's really a matter of personal preference I I like to sew a little cut a little I always love the reveal of seeing that color underneath so really just you know feel do what makes you feel happy in the moment I find cutting a little bit harder than sewing so sometimes I'll sew at night and cut in the morning when the light is better so it's really up to you and what you like to do so I have this one shape sewn. I'm just going to take my 5 inch embroidery scissor here. I'm going to insert right on the edge and cut that away. Again, we don't sew across the edges there. I'm going to not cut any closer than an eighth of an inch next to my stitching line. Once it gets too close, you're just going to leave that little part there and not cut that amount out. And reveal that shape underneath. And so you just carry on the whole, pull this back out. 
you know, you just carry on stitching around each of the individual shapes until you've completed the entire swatch or garment as you like, and then cut everything away. So we also want to show you a few other possibilities for ways that you can use this technique. So I have some swatches here. So for our regular reverse applique, you know, we sew exactly on this stenciled line. So really using that edge between the, the stenciled line and the unstenciled fabric for where we place our stitches. There's another option where you can sew an eighth of an inch inside the stenciled line as well and trim everything away on the outside of the fabric. And this technique we call negative reverse applique. So it's really simple and the same rules apply. You can put your knots on the back side of the fabric like you have here, or you can put your knots on the outside of the fabric like you have here. And so it just has, gives the individual piece a different look. I love this technique. Your project will winds up being a little bit lighter, so it feels more like a single layer layer garment than a double layer garment so these are great for summertime that sort of thing something else you can do i'm um, using the same option of stitching inside the line this is a technique we call inked and quilted and so we just take a regular sharpie marker and um, after we've sewn our piece we just do a little tracing around the stenciled shape on the outside. It's a really lovely technique. It's relatively permanent. It'll stay for a long time. You just don't want to dry clean your pieces because it can make the Sharpie marker go away. But we recommend uh, machine washing anyway. So this is another technique that we call outside reverse applique. So you can see on this piece that all of the stenciling has been cut away. And the way you accomplish this is to sew an eighth of an inch. Instead of an eighth of an inch inside the stenciled line, you're going to sew an eighth of an inch on the outside of the stenciled line and cut exactly on the stenciled line to remove all of the paint. Also a very beautiful technique. This last piece is what we call backstitch reverse applique, which is a really beautiful technique. It uses um, this lovely embroidery floss. We use four strands of embroidery floss for, for this. You can see on the back that backstitch is really lovely. It takes about three times the time to do backstitch over regular reverse applique. And when you compare the backs of them, you can see why. With a running stitch, you're just taking one stitch at a time. With the backstitch, you go backwards to come forwards. And so you do also get this very beautiful, uh, almost like a stem stitch on the back of your backstitch reverse applique. A lot of people wear these garments as reversible. And even our regular reverse applique, a lot of people will turn them inside out and wear them in two different ways. So if somebody's sewing for me, I want backstitch. If I'm sewing myself, I want to do reverse applique. I enjoy just the simplicity and the meditative quality of the, of the running stitch around the reverse applique. So now I'm going to uh, show you just how to complete the negative reverse applique should you want to do that. I'm just going to take the swatch that we worked with earlier and work on the other side to show you how to stitch inside the line and cut on the outside of the line. I still have my thread here. I'm just going to tie another knot. So as I mentioned, I really like negative reverse applique for lighter weight garments. So for this technique, I'm going to put my knots on the back. So I'm going to come up from the bottom this time, about an eighth of an inch in from the stenciled line. And I'm just going to, just as before, I'm going to do my running stitch, going down and coming up about an eighth of an inch from the edge, checking my tension, everything exactly the same. Look, I have a little tangle here. I'm going to pull this out with my, the eye of my needle and straighten that back out. This little shape here is quite small. I'm just going to turn around and go back. Again, trying to keep about an eighth of an inch from the edge. I'm going to turn this over to the back and tie my knot on the back making the loop and sewing through it, making a loop and sewing through it for my double knot. Give it a little tug. Remember that your knot is the only thing holding your hand stitching in your fabric project, so make sure that you get those knots really tight. Then once you've finished your sewing, you'll go in and instead of trimming on the inside of your stitching line, you're going to trim on the outside of your stitching line approximately an eighth of an inch from the edge of your stenciled line. So you'll peel that back and just see that it has the appearance of applique.
Okay, so let's look at what our panels look like with our regular reverse applique. You know, we have two finished skirts, one with reverse applique and one with negative reverse applique. And you can see that the look is very different, similar, but very different, and both are really beautiful. Our panels, you know, one of the things that folks always ask is, you know, what happens if I cut through the back layer? Cutting can be really scary. And, um, you know, every single one of us who's sewn in this method has at one point cut through the back or cut an applique that they weren't supposed to. And, you know, we have a, a a little saying in our office that perfect is the enemy of great so in the grander scheme of things when the skirt is put together you don't notice so much all the little tiny imperfections but notice the beauty of the whole and so you can see also the Magdalena stencil has some very tiny little areas you can choose to cut those you can also choose not to cut them here's an area where uh, some of the stencil shape in the middle of the flower were left uncut and that's equally as beautiful. So the journey is the destination and don't worry, settle in, enjoy the process of doing this, you know, because when the whole skirt is put together, you don't notice so much the little tiny intricacies. You just really see the beauty of the overall project. So in our next lesson, we're going to take these panels and start putting our skirt together.